As far as the Prime Minister is concerned, I think it's important for us to recognise the pressure that's on him from the economic players in Britain, business in particular, the city, those pressures to reconfigure British policy are growing and are growing substantially. They are an operational factor in his, almost in his daily life uh, as Prime Minister. Hello, I'm Brendan Donnelly. I'm the director of the Federal Trust. The title of our video today is Can the EU and the UK Learn to Love Each Other? And that's the topic I shall be discussing with John Palmer, a member of the Federal Trust Council, former Europe editor of The Guardian and former political director of the European Policy Centre. Uh, John, welcome. There's been a, a lot of chat both in London and Brussels over the past few weeks about the way in which perhaps the Westminster, the, the Windsor framework work um, might be the basis of a, a reset in, in UK EU relations. Um, President Biden seems to have a slightly more sardonic view of this issue. He said the other day that it was only because he was present that um, that uh, uh, the Brits, as he, he put it, um, weren't able to screw around with the agreement. Um, is it possible to take a, a more uh, sanguine view um, than what seems to be his uh, about the way in which uh, indeed this framework may may lead to a, a more constructive set of um, of dealings uh, between the EU and the UK and and what would this look like what would be the concrete outcome if if indeed there there is um, this new more positive atmosphere? Yes, I I think uh, I I think of it as the first signs of the tide changing. Now, I stress the first tides, the, tri the tide is a long way off coming back in to full tide, uh, and we can discuss whether that's at all realistic or when it might happen. But that the tide is changing, I think the evidence increases. Um, you can look at this at a number of levels. One is that opinion polling um, in this country uh, and this is the important one in, in the context we're talking about, is that Brexit has failed, has proved to be a failure, uh, and that there is support for some attempt to reverse the uh, consequences of Brexit, um, uh, uh, even a majority for people who would wish to have at some point uh, a decision-making opportunity on rejoining the Union. That's at one level. At a, at a level of operational politics, governments, the institutions of the European Union, I think there is a concerted attempt, which includes even to some extent, difficult though it is for me to say it, this government in London, seeking to improve relations, make them work better, not at the moment questioning the fundamental pillars of Brexit, but looking for ways uh, to make it work. Their priority is one, security consequent upon the war in uh, Ukraine and uh, related matters, but also touching on the huge question of relationships with China over the next decades. That's one thing where the consequence of Britain leaving has added a, an unnecessary uh, obstacle in the way of a thorough uh, coordination of uh, security policy. Secondly, is the economics. Economic consequences have proved awful uh, for this country. There is no doubt. Uh, looking to the medium term and the government's own statistical authority uh, uh, points out our performance in the economy in the UK will be continuing to be below that of the rest of the union. Some problems are shared in common. Our performance looks like lagging and lagging more seriously with the passage of time. All of this is creating, I just conclude, all of this is creating um, a set of pressures that uh, governments uh, uh, and the institutions have to respond to. And I think there are some time, signs that this government uh, is willing to begin to think about that uh, as we see in the alleged bonfire of Brussels laws issue in the House of Commons this week. It's ironic, yes. isn't it, that if that's a correct analysis, it's taking place under the watch of uh, Rishi Sunak, 
because uh, I think he's probably the the only conservative leader, um, well, perhaps since Margaret Thatcher, uh, who genuinely believed in Brexit, um, and yet he he seems to be engaged upon a a program uh, which can only be described as a, a mitigation uh, of the problems of Brexit. There's an implicit recognition that Brexit has not led, led anywhere very uh, attractive for the country. Um, and these problems need uh, at least to have an, a, 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 a sticking plaster uh, applied to them. Uh, how far do you think his party is going to allow him to go in that direction? Um, there was a very interesting exchange yesterday in the House of Commons between Bill Cash and, and Kemi Badenoch, in which um, she accused him and the people who think like him uh, of being all, all, all mouth and, and no action. Uh, this is a very interesting split within the Conservative Party, and I'm not sure how it's going to play out. Do, do you have any insights on that? Well, <clears throat> you raise a very difficult and complex question. As far as the Prime Minister is concerned, I think it's uh, it would be important for us to recognise the pressure that's on him from the economic players in, 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 in Britain, business in particular, the city, those pressures to reconfigure British policy are growing and are growing substantially. They are they are an operational factor in his almost in his daily life as uh, uh, as prime minister, and that applies to much of the government as a whole. Those pressures are acute and they're going to grow. <clears throat> they're going to grow because I come back to my basic point, the failure of Brexit economically is only going to deepen at any rate in the short and medium term, whatever about the distant future. So that's one level. Secondly, I think he, he kind of knows what the outcome of the next general election is likely to be. He's looking to mitigate the worst aspects of a, a devastating Tory route, and he probably thinks, and certainly members of his cabinet think, that they need to show some resilience in the pressure against the extreme right wing, the nationalists, the populists, the Brexit hardliners. So I think all of those factors explain some of his recent movements, but I quite agree with your implication. <clears throat> it, it is something of a contradiction. Uh, with the position that the Prime Minister took not that long ago during the, the, the campaign, uh, which Boris Johnson headed, uh, 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 and which is now somewhat discredited, as indeed Mr Johnson's own political record in the party looks to be fairly discredited. That's rubbed off on Brexit as well. Bill Cash made a, a powerful point in the House of Commons yesterday that, uh, mm -hmm. uh, that in his leadership campaign last year, um, Sunak attached a lot of importance to this idea of a bonfire of the regulations. Uh, he's very definitely resiled from that. Um, but can we go back to what might be the, the concrete implications uh, of, uh, of, of this reset in relationship if it's going to happen? Um, isn't there a danger of too much expectations on both sides? We, we know that the Horizon programme is, is not going uh, as easily in its ne negotiation as might have been hoped certainly by the British government. Um, I think it's inevitable that for uh, a closer relationship to be endorsed or accepted by the EU, there will have to be uh, implications for the European institutions, such as the ECJ, which is always a big neuralgic point for the Conservative Party. And it may well be that on the other side, the EU um, expects a, uh, a greater realism and modesty that from the British side than at the moment, culturally and institutionally, the British um, side is, is prepared to show. Um, what do you think the chances are for, for real mitigations of part, um, beyond the purely symbolic? Well, I think you're right that there are few, if anybody, with any illusions in Brussels left uh, uh, that uh, dealing with this is going to be straightforward or that uh, substantial evidence of a change in mindset uh, in London uh, isn't required. I'm sure that is more true now than ever, in particular because the European Union has business priorities of its own that are becoming more acute. Uh, they all point in different ways to the need 
for closer integration at European level it may take different forms, whether we're talking about climate, whether we're talking about uh, broader economic recovery, whether we're talking about the consequences of a common foreign and security policy. Uh, I think that all of those priorities will probably remain dominant in Brussels, but there is an acceptance uh, quite widely that their lives would be considerably simpler or eased if they had a cooperative working relationship with the UK. I think many of them believe that in the UK's own interests, that may well uh, need to involve some uh, accommodation uh, over the questions most immediately of the customs union and the single market, uh, not perhaps in terms of immediately rejoining or uh, coming within the sphere of common decision making, but to prepare the ground for that in terms of some of the programs you've just mentioned, um, uh, Horizon, Erasmus, the, there are others. And there <clears throat> we have to see how serious the British are. I suspect they will want agreements on those things, and I suspect there is a recognition for as long as this government is in place, because we mustn't talk as though the mandate of this government is going to extend very much beyond the end of next year, uh, if at all beyond the end of next year, uh, they, they, they recognise that a political change is coming in Britain, uh, and they're looking to themselves to try and measure what the implications of that are for this desire to seek a closer accommodation with the UK and, where possible, um, a, 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 a common agreement on important policies. If, if over the next few months and perhaps even the next few years, um, with this policy being taken up by uh, a, a new Labour government or a Labour um, Liberal coalition government, um, if there is this um, process of, uh, as it were, incremental problem solving of incremental convergence, um, do you think that has implications for the eventual prospect of the United Kingdom's rejoining the European Union? Uh, people from the ERG in particular, I think, would say uh, this is putting us on a slippery slope. We will find ourselves gradually accepting things about um, community, U European Union membership that we thought we were, were rid of. Um, uh, and indeed, there will be some on the, the former Remainer side who say, um, softly, softly, um, grandmother steps, or whatever you like to call it, is the way to get back into the European Union. Um, uh, do you do you think that incrementalism has implications for the viability of rejoining the European Union, or not? Or does it make no difference? No, I think it does. It does have an importance, and I think it is probably the only way in the immediate future that the UK can be seen to be on a track of greater convergence uh, with the European Union broadly. At a fairly early juncture, the questions that you've just raised will have to be confronted. I have no doubt about it. Uh, I think in the case of the single market and the customs union, uh, some sort of e evolving agreement of de facto alignment, de facto alignment, uh, with the uh, uh, conditions and prescriptions of the of, of the single market, I think is almost inevitable. Um, it, whether it can be sliced and diced in stages, uh, I don't know. I suspect um, that it will be presented as an evolutionary process, even though in practice it's putting the UK on a track which logically logically has to lead to uh, uh, membership of the union because of course the closer de facto alignment takes place on not only on single market and customs union but so many other common issues the more the question about what is britain's decision making role in that process what is the democratic uh, involvement uh, in the decision making yeah. role uh, i.e membership um, how are we going to continue on this uh, in with the consequences, but out with the decision making? I think that will become an issue. Last point, I think that, uh, and we'll probably want to come on to this, uh, that much will depend upon the 
uh, style of the incoming government, whether it's a majority Labour government, and I think you're right, it's more likely to be a coalition government in practice, uh, probably with the Liberals. Uh, and I think uh, that will be the dominant political mood music over the next few years, where all of these issues are going to be resolved and discussed. So don't underestimate how a different government changes some of the mood music in this country, uh, but it will be in the direction that I think is already evident, even without a change of government. Can I just make as an observation that I have hesitations about this incrementalist um, uh, approach to rejoining. Um, I think that one of the problems about the British membership throughout all the period when we were in the European Union was that it, it was always presented um, as being something which happened to the United Kingdom rather than something that we had consciously and existentially chosen. I think the idea that um, in 10 years' time, um, former Remainers or rejoiners are getting up and saying, well, actually, what we've done over the past 10 years leaves us with no real choice other than to join the European Union. I think that that is, is a recipe for, for disillusionment and, and a great deal of, of dislocation in the British political culture. So I've just warned against it. I'm all in favour of uh, incrementalism as long as you spell out quite clearly where it is you're going. But if you don't spell out clearly where you're going, then then I think you you store up problems for yourself later on. Um, I don't part. But you, you might agree with that. Do, do you see? I, 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 I see. I see where you're coming from, Brendan. But I think that you've got to see the political climate. Uh, uh, it, it, it's a bit like the weather. When the high and low pressure things shift, then lots of other things start shifting at the same time. There is a kind of kind of dynamism in the process of working towards closer alignment and the reality of joining. I, uh, I remain uh, a 100% fully rejoin, and not only fully rejoin, be become a full and enthusiastic partner, partner in the process of building further European integration, that which does not currently exists, but which urgently needs to exist, and I think is going to happen. I think that those voices will be emboldened, will be enlarged, will be become more influential uh, as the, the train leaves the wreckage uh, of uh, where uh, Mr. Johnson and his cohorts have led us. Uh, but it, it is going to happen, I think, because even people who supported uh, Brexit recognise what a train crash this has been. It has been a failure, not just in our eyes, that's not important. It's been an utter failure in the eyes of so many of the people who kind of bought into it. Uh, it's been a shock um, lesson, uh, but uh, it's one that I think is going to play out politically in the, in the years immediately ahead. You mentioned the possibility of changes coming about uh, as a result of a new administration. Um, might it not be that Sunak, to some extent, has has taken the ground from under Dharma's feet in saying um, a more conciliatory tone and politer tone will get better results than, by implication, um, the, the the polemics of, of my predecessors? Um, can you just speculate in conclusion about uh, how you think um, different kinds of, of government uh, after 2024 might play the European issue. Um, Labour as a, a, a single governing party is one thing, a coalition is another. Something that perhaps is just worth, worth concluding on is uh, if the Conservative Party did get re-elected, um, what would the implications be of, of that for its European policy? Might it not have the paradoxical implication that it would find itself even more um, unattractively confronted with the economic con uh, consequences um, uh, of its own improvidence um, in the referendum? Well, the two, two very, very different questions. I think the reality is that we're going to face a different government. Not certain, nothing is certain electorally, but the evidence looks pretty clear that people have rejected as a failure this government, not, not just on this issue, but on so many other issues. It's one of those sea change movements. I don't think it's going to be a 1945 in the sense 
that Labour swept in with a majority, just an overwhelming majority, but I think they will have a clear operational majority uh, with partners in, in, in a government where there will be a clear majority of people wanting to move back into a new and more positive relationship. Lots of MPs on the Labour uh, side, let alone the Liberals, who have wrongly believed that silence is golden, uh, will suddenly find themselves emboldened to discuss the implications, the, the real politic moves that will be taking place, where they are pointing to, what the implications are, what the opportunities are. And I think in all of this, uh, Brendan, we need to see it against the, the, the setting of two things. We are heading for a worrying de decline in economic performance, more than just cyclical. We're not talking about the normal cycles of up and down. A generic secular decline, productivity, uh, wealth creation potential, investment potential, etc. The contrast with our European neighbours is going to become more and more acute. It will become, awareness of it will be the new common sense of the age. So I think that is the context in which this is happening. Uh, uh, Keir Starmer is a man who, I think wrongly, believes that silence is always golden electorally. Uh, I don't accept that on this or, or indeed on other issues. But in government, uh, 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 with an opportunity from Brussels to look at the issues that are uh, exacerbating Britain's circumstances, economically, uh, uh, decision-making, etc. I think you will find a new dynamic beginning and the laying down of a kind of a new common sense, uh, uh, as I call it. Um, I don't think a Conservative government is any kind of a realistic, uh, a realistic situation. But you asked me the question, my answer is, I think much the same would happen, but much more slowly, much more with much greater fragility uh, and the danger of reversal. Good. Well, thank you very much indeed. We've had a very interesting um, conversation. Um, we'll review it in a year's time and see how much of it has, has been confirmed or, or, or rebutted by events. Um, this is the latest of our Federal Trust um, podcast. Um, we hope you've enjoyed it. There are many more on our uh, in our archives and at our website, and I hope you'll find material there for instruction um, and even amusement. Thank you very much.